So um, thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you to the Lithuanian Un Architects Union and to Struktum for inviting me. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Matozzi. I'm an associate architect at MVRDV, where I've worked for the past seven years. Uh, today, uh, the topic of the lecture will be um, how uh, we approach our approach to housing density, and by that I mean um, how we approach uh, addressing and allocating density as a as a general topic in our uh, projects and specifically in housing uh, projects. Um, before I move on, a little introduction to the office for the ones that do not know it. Uh, MVRDV was established in 1993 by Vini Maas, Jakob van Rijs, and Nathalie de Vries. Um, over, 30 years, uh, um, over the last 30 years, we have designed uh, a lot of ambitious and renowned projects all over the world. Uh, we, are a large, um, uh, we have a large uh, company and talented people from uh, uh, very international. We are located in Rotterdam, which is our headquarter, but we also have satellite branches in our main markets, which are the US, France, Germany, and China. Um, we do design, we design at every scale from master plan to architecture to uh, interior design and uh, product design. And over the years, we have um, gathered quite some expertise in these areas specifically. Um, these are some of the buildings um, that made the office, some of the landmark buildings that uh, made the office name. Uh, I'm going to talk about Wazoko and Silodam uh, specifically today, and I will end up with Valley. Um, I can't, um, we don't just design buildings, we also do research with every building we design. And we collaborate very frequently with the Y Factory, which is the think tank led by Vini Mas at the University of Delft. Um, MVRDV and the Y Factory have published several books over the years. Why is this? Okay. Okay, so several books about the research we do on um, uh, city planning and architecture. And um, I, I have to mention three seminal books which uh, inform uh, the way we operate. Um, this is the very first publication of MVRDV, which is Pharmax excursions on density, and this is really uh, an exploration on, uh, on, uh, on the opportunities that density can provide us uh, in organizing space, in uh, making it uh, more uh, surprising, uh, optimizing it, without compromising the quality of life. Um, it's not, it's not uh, by chance that uh, uh, the office was born with such interest in density since the Netherlands is the most densely populated uh, country in Europe, essentially, and one of the first 25 in the world. Uh, the second book is Meta City Data Town, and this is important as well because it shows how our fascination uh, uh, about data and representing uh, cities and buildings through data, gathering data, and operating with new technologies. Uh, finally, the, other, the last book is uh, KM3 or KM3 which is uh, excursion on capacities, and this is also an exploration about density, but in this, in, in this case, it's more about uh, trying to provide the same rich experience of uh, a ground-level city neighborhood uh, in, in a vertical building. Uh, so the richness, the variety, uh, the diversity, the inclusiveness of a neighborhood in one building. So in planning, everything is about density, except density. Density, for us, is about opportunity. And so an opportunity to foster diversity, enrich the living environment, and make experiencing the city more human. In the end, can we humanize density? This is the question. And those were the initial books. These are some of the last researches we've done and some of the last publications. And as you can see, porosity is really about uh, density in high-rise buildings. And, um, and then co-living is about mixed-use buildings, making them more interesting, uh, more mixed. And Solarscape Rooftop Catalog and Roofscape are researches about, uh, about uh, densifying the existing, uh, specifically with an eye on Rotterdam. So the first building I'm going to talk about is Wazoko, which is also the first housing project by MVRDV. It's a, an assisted living for the seniors, uh, for people over uh, 55, year, uh, 55 years. And um, it consists of 100 residential units. 
So in this case, the, the complexity was that we had to create, create more GFA, uh, maximize the FAR uh, in a plot that didn't provide that. Uh, so can, the question is, can we make the most of limited urban space with, while balancing open areas, light and air? Um, this is the site. Um, so we are on the outskirts of um, Amsterdam on the western side in a very uh, residential neighborhood, um, low rise with lots of open spaces and very strict regulations uh, about height, uh, open spaces, light and air circulation. So the client came to us, the client came to us with already a scheme of a north, northwest, south, southeast um, oriented building with the gallery on the northern side. And they wanted to provide 100 apartments for um, uh, the senior citizens and they could only fit 87 due to regulations. So uh, at, at, in the end, uh, we, we said, uh, why don't we uh, provide this extra density, this extra GFA by gluing literally the 13 missing units um, to the north facade. We make use of the circulation. We don't um, touch the plot in front. We don't um, remove, um, we, we don't cast shadow to the neighbors and also we don't cast shadow on our own southern facade. So this was, uh, this was the proposal. Uh, the proposal eventually was, was accepted. And so you have this uh, extraordinary and also playful solution to, to the issue of density. And, uh, and although we have northern facing apartments, because they stick out, they also receive enough eastern and western daylight. So 87 stacked units and 13 cantilevered units. You see, this is the southern facade, very lively and colorful, uh, which is an uh, MVRDV trademark. And you have the northern facade, which is, which is um, this one with the, with the flying, uh, flying houses and the, and the gallery. Um, this, is, this was a very, sorry, I don't know why this is. This was a very um, low budget building. And it shows that even with a low budget, you can provide uh, an iconic solution. And this is a few years ago. It still holds up pretty well. The next building I'm going to talk about is Silodam, which is a residential complex. Um, this, in this case, it's mixed, mixed use, uh, mainly housing. Um, but there are also office spaces, uh, leisure spaces, cultural spaces, and commercial spaces. Uh, in this case, the, the question was not only how do we deal with density, but it was also how do we make uh, the building more diverse socially? Uh, how do we uh, deal with connectivity, social interaction, uh, and, uh, and a mixed program? Um, so this is the site is northwest uh, of Amsterdam, uh, right facing the harbor. It's in the place it's in the place of, um, it's along a dam, uh, a dock, which uh, had uh, historical grain silos and this uh, whole dam had to be uh, transformed, renovated. So in order to pay for this renovation and this transformation, um, the idea was to uh, provide apartments and uh, um, that would pay partially for the rest of the transformation. So the client wanted to make a uh, good profit on these apartments and wanted to attend to a very dynamic market at the end of the 90s in, in the Netherlands. And the client realized that by waiting a little bit or by waiting at the right time to uh, freeze the design and sell the apartments could make a little bit more profit. So the, the design of the building had always to take this flexibility over time into account. So how did we deal with that? So we, we, in response to this dynamic housing market, we introduced a variety of living typologies. We wanted uh, diversity also in the, in the type of tenants. And this graph uh, shows the different type of uh, apartments and the spaces, and also the, the number of them and the square meters. And this changed over time until the market uh, and the until the design was uh, ready and the market was ripe and they could be sold. 
It includes 157 apartments, uh, both for available for purchase and rent, as well as office spaces, commercial spaces, and so forth. Um, just to make this flexibility uh, um, a little bit more efficient, um, the, the, the apartment types were clustered into 8 to 12 apartments, uh, which uh, collectively made uh, what we called neighborhoods. So you see here an array of neighborhoods that form the whole building. This is in floor plan, and here you see it in elevation. And we wanted to express this diversity, this variety, this richness, also through the facades. And this is a, an initial study model, which, where every neighborhood is, has its own identity and is characterized by a different material, different color, and so forth. Uh, so the project, this project explores uh, also different financial categories, and those are expressed through the architecture, through the window sizes, for instance, through the facade materials, and through also uh, the circulation and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the open spaces. This project also starts to um, deal with porosity, so the, the necessity to open up the building to the city, to, let, uh, to have a, a better uh, connection and, uh, between a private building and the public space, and it allows people to go through it and reach the terrace over the harbor. As, as the building by itself is denying the view of the harbor, we kind of give it back by doing such a, such a gesture. Uh, as you can see here, the very diverse facades that indicate uh, this, this building really um, attends to several segments of the market, um, and uh, both rental and purchase. And as Natalie de Vries puts it correctly, this is not just a cross-section of a building, it's a cross-section of the Amsterdam society. Um, these are just some photos of, of the facades. This is, this is the, the facade from the dam, from the main access. And these, you can see it in the harbor. And these are some of the entrances. There are some private entrances and as well as these are some of the apartments with the private entrance, and this is the main entrance to the building, which leads to this shared and social space uh, underneath and eventually to the terrace. So this is, those are spaces for the community, and there are more spaces within the building as well. This is the terrace over the harbor. And of course, there is an entrance from, from the water side, and um, and which is also collective space. And it's very, uh, be because of the, the nature of the building and, and, uh, and this cluster of neighborhoods, each one with a different type of circulation. Uh, some are, have uh, middle corridors, some have galleries, some have patios and so on. Uh, it was important that we were able to um, help people uh, understanding where they were. So color in this case is really a tool for wayfinding and identifying the neighborhood where you are. And this is, a, this is an approach we, we still use today, and we use color very boldly uh, at MVRDB, as you can see here. These are some of the apartments. This is double height apartment, uh, another type of apartment. This, these are some of the penthouses with, um, with the little patios from above, and eventually, yeah, the view over the harbor. And this leads me to uh, Valley, where, um, on top of addressing all the topics that I mentioned before, uh, here we uh, address much more the topic of porosity, of uh, biodiversity, sustainability, uh, and, and really engaging the public into a private building and have a conversation. This is um, a very large, very complex project. Um, it, it, is, um, it is a large plinth with three towers. Uh, the three towers are um, housing, and the plinth is a mixed use. And uh, at the top, we have uh, max 28 stories, 198 residential units. As I said, the, the, the question here was really, can we humanize density? Can we integrate nature and enhance well-being? Can we provide a richer experience for everyone? Not just for the people in the building or using the building, but literally for everyone. So these were some of our ambitions, and 
our questions, how do we introduce this topic? For instance, how do we take such a large building and make it more human scale? Uh, that's that's, a, that's a, ta a tall task on its own. Um, these were the client's ambitions, so 75,000 square meters, 50% minimum of housing, house sustainability standards, and so forth and so on. The site is the south part of Amsterdam, which is um, a, a growing uh, neighborhood, uh, very, um, which is uh, brand new and uh, growing uh, by the day. At the time when we, we started, uh, there were mainly just offices because the location of the plot is in Zaudas, which is the south axis, which is uh, the business district. So, um, and it was the first and only mixed-use building at the time. This is a top view. And so the building, the plot is really in the threshold in between uh, a working area, like a, a business area, and, uh, and, uh, and housing. And um, here, the, the, the street that you see highlighted here is Beethovenstraat, so it leads to, to the um, housing uh, neighborhoods on, on the northern, northern side, and it connects them to the business district. So we are in between these two, and also we are in between two very different spatial contexts. On the one side, a very solid context, very closed off, a glazed facade, flat facades um, that from the street um, do not provide any engagement for, for people and, uh, and, and basically see, see are sealing off uh, any, any interaction. And then on the, on the right side, we have this wonderful emptiness um, uh, of the soccer, of the football fields. And so on the apparent lifelessness of the uh, office buildings, we have this lively uh, emptiness uh, on the right side. So how do we deal with these different natures of uh, housing and office and uh, liveliness and uh, greenery and, uh, and the business district? Uh, and so we started with the, the constraints. This is the building envelope. And we definitely didn't want something uh, this um, big and massive uh, to be on the site. Um, we wanted really people to experience through the building, still experience uh, the, 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 the light of day, the sky, and really open up the building to the neighborhood. So we, we started by building up the plinth, which was uh, sizable. I mean, it's a seven story plinth with cultural and uh, program and shops, uh, office floors, and then the housing volume. And we really try to open it up towards the eastern uh, light and let the light coming through the building. And then we wanted to, the facade to be contextual. And we thought, well, we are surrounded by office buildings uh, and, uh, and we have a big issue of noise uh, because the building is right next to the highway, right next to the railway, and of course, surrounded by cars. So how do we, how are we contextual and at the same time, um, at the same time this is not an office building, this is a housing building, so how do we make it more interesting? And so we said, if we um, treat the outer facade uh, to be more contextual to the business district, but we treat the inner facade to be more contextual to the housing needs, uh, we can provide a very different and interesting experience within a dense building. And the jagged uh, uh, facade really helps also with the wind forces and with the, with the noise nuisance. And by carving it like this, we provide uh, more light to the building, but even we are able to provide more light to Beethovenstraat in the end. And so, so we have this contextual exterior and the terraced interior. These were some of the uh, study models initially. And, and this is the, from a programmatic point of view, parking and logistics, cultural program, shops and retails, offices up to the seventh floor, and from the eighth floor and above, it's housing. Um, also, the, we wanted to integrate greenery, um, and, and this is very much part of the design. It's, it, it's very much part of the solution to some of the problems we had, and I will show it as we look into the facade. 
and, and, uh, and the landscape really changes from east to west, from bottom up, uh, just like it would uh, on, a, on, a, on a mountain in, in nature. Um, so the plinth is very lively, but what makes this plinth really, really interesting is the fact that it's open to the public. So we are providing public space on top of our building, on top of the plinth. Everyone is invited to walk on top and go through the valley. Uh, it also connects to the other side. And in addition to that, you can walk into the grotto, uh, which is the interior space. It's a semi-public um, uh, gallery space uh, that receives light from above and then uh, gives access to cultural and event spaces and commercial spaces. Of course, we have a, a restaurant and a public viewing in the top towers to appreciate the surrounding. So, we have this smooth mirror glass along the outer facades, and then we have this jagged inner facade made of natural stone and greenery inside. Um, why so? Because we want to provide a rich experience, and a rich and nice experience, to housing and living, even in a dense building, even in a high rise. And so by pushing and pulling the facade, we can create special situations, special moments that enhance the, 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 the vision of the surrounding, enhance also the quality of living and the sun exposure. At the same time, of course, this leads to lots of issues with privacy, and that's where uh, refining the design helps with that, but also the, the, the plants and the, and the greenery is really uh, useful in that, in that sense. Uh, and we studied this extensively to provide the optimal sun exposure for each apartment and each room within the apartments. And, and finally, of course, uh, the, the big issue with noise and wind nuisance is also solved through this type of facades. And those are the green terraces. So this is an animation of the, of the very different floor plans that happened in one of the towers. At the same time, we have also this wonderful and rich landscape, which is growing year by year. So it's, it's already the, the building is, is already much greener than what I'm going to show you, uh, show you here. Uh, over 13,000 plants, uh, uh, and we have even small trees in the bottom part. Um, this is just, just to show the, the ground floor. This is the grotto, the semi-public space on the first floor. And as we move up, the offices disappear and the, uh, the residential towers starts appearing and the greenery also is always a... So this is the landscape, the, the sort of geological natural landscape within this tower. It's, uh, it's quite staggering. Uh, instead of looking at um, glazing business, uh, business-like buildings, we're looking into um, an in incredible views. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, as I said, this is far more green than when this picture was taken. And it's, uh, it's providing a unique housing experience within, within a high rise. So with this building, so the, the, the sorry, so, so the vision for the building was to really humanize density and transform cities into greener, denser, and more human environments. And, uh, and with this building, we think we succeeded. Um, it's like we took a shell of a lifeless business-looking uh, building, and we literally carved life into it. And today, this is really a symphony of life with, for people to work, walk, do sports, shop, and relax, uh, and do gardening as well within the same building. So eventually, <coughs> with this building, what we achieved is that, what I said at the beginning, the, the complexity and the richness and the diversity and the inclusiveness of a ground level of a city neighborhood, it's finally vertical on one building. And with this, I think I conclude. Thank you.